In the modern world, when certain abstractions come to mind, we are all naturally inclined to comprehend such notions in accordance with the modern mindset to which we are beholden. Furthermore, we have this unfortunate, albeit understandable, tendency to assume that these concepts are static, primarily with regards to our understanding of them. Each generation has had this problem, and it will likely continue to persist for as long as humanity lives on this earth. Societies evolve, and, as they do so, so too does our understanding of things. Science, religion, politics, mathematics, while they have always existed, Man's cultural outlook on such things, and the definitional lens through which he examines them, both philosophically and methodologically, is, and always has, varied from generation to generation, with these epochal shifts in perspective commonly informed by a mixture of new discoveries and a change in the cultural zeitgeist. This also applies to our understanding of history, which, in the age of modernity, is almost universally understood through the lens of empiricism and the scientific method. As such, we frequently make the mistake of projecting this inherently modern European basis of understanding history upon other peoples and cultures, both past and present. The study of history and the quest to understand the peoples and worlds of ages past is and has forever been an ongoing endeavor. Our current understanding of history in the historical process encompassing a broad range of differing perspectives is the sporadic culmination of hundreds of years with the debates between various thinkers and the synthesis of ideas across generational dialogue between countless historians and philosophers spanning thousands of years. Typically, when we think of those individuals whose contributions had the greatest impact on the development of history as both an academic and a philosophical discipline, the first names that come to mind might be those of Herodotus or Thucydides or Augustine or Gibbon, all major historians of their own respective times. But we would be mistaken to think that historians are the only ones who are responsible for shaping how people view history. Quite the contrary. The truth is that most history books that are and have been written and by extension the people who have and do write them, have not had much of an impact in the greater scheme of things. Ironically, history has forgotten more of these than it has remembered. In actuality, it has often been the unlikely influence of non-historians which is most responsible for shaping our perspectives on history, whether it is intentional or not. If we were to take someone like Leo Tolstoy, a novelist, and compare him to even the greatest academics of his own time, it would not even be a contest as to whose writings had the more profound effect. Not everybody reads history. As a genre of literature, historical nonfiction simply lacks the same broad appeal of other genres, such as fiction, poetry, and theater. And this is hardly only relegated to the realm of creative literature, it applies just as much to music film, and, perhaps most of all, traditional visual art. Humans are visual beings, and thus visual imagery provides us with the most cogent means of allowing us to better understand and make sense of the world around us. Save for those who were around to experience the events for themselves, photographs and paintings are what primarily define our perception of historical episodes and concepts. And for as long as visual art has existed, this has always been the case. Although consisting predominantly of poets and writers, American Romanticism and, eventually, Transcendentalism was by no means exclusively a literary movement. Like its continental counterpart, these ideas often express themselves through visual mediums as well, namely in the works of such European painters as Francisco Goya, William Blake, and Caspar David Friedrich. But, as it happened, the themes that these artists expressed within their paintings strongly resonated not only with the men and women of the Old World, 
Much as the ideas of the Enlightenment had done a century prior, the ideals and motifs of Romanticism soon found themselves spreading westward, and it would not be long before they began to seep their way into the American artistic scene. By 1830, the influences of Romanticism on American art had become ascendant, as more and more artists began emulating the Romanticist themes and motifs of their continental counterparts in order to convey their personal attitudes towards the state of American society. Among the most prolific of these artists was British-born American landscape painter Thomas Cole, founder of the Hudson River School art movement. Born in Lancashire in 1801, Cole immigrated to the United States with his family following the Napoleonic Wars settling along the Ohio River, where he would spend the next five years of his life. During this time, Cole would fall in love with the natural beauty of his adopted nation, a far cry from the rapidly growing industrial landscape of his native country, where the English countryside, with its dwindling population, had become provincialized and exhausted of possibilities, made effectively irrelevant due to the triumphant march of industry. The untamed wilderness of the New World was untainted from the blight of civilization. And it was this love that ultimately inspired Cole to hone his artistic talents and inscribe the marvels of the American landscape upon the canvas. Unlike many of his contemporaries, Cole was largely self-taught in the art of painting. He spent the next five years of his life carefully studying the works of other artists and reading books on subjects pertaining to his hobby. And then, Shortly after his 22nd birthday, Cole bade his beloved valley farewell, leaving Ohio behind and moving to Philadelphia. Welcome to Philly! Cole found work as an engraver and then as an itinerant portrait painter. During his time living in Philadelphia, Cole joined his local lodge, through which he became acquainted with the painter, playwright, and historian William Dunlap, with whom Cole shared many common interests and philosophical views. He also became close friends with fellow artist and engraver Asher Brown Durand, who was instrumental in helping Cole get noticed. Through Durand's connections, Cole began working closely with various members of the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, where he was able to get a number of his paintings showcased in a handful of the Institute's gallery exhibitions. While having already since made a name for himself within the mid-Atlantic art scene, the true turning point in Cole's career occurred in the summer of 1825, when one of his patrons offered to send Cole on a holiday to the Hudson River Valley. All expenses paid. Cole became enamored with the beauty of its majestic scenery, and dedicated most of his sojourn to capturing the natural landscape in some of the valley's most prominent landmarks upon his canvas. Cole described his summer spent in the Hudson River Valley as being the most moving experience of his entire life. So moving, in fact, that immediately upon returning to Philadelphia, he sold his house, packed his bags, and moved to Catskill, New York, where he would live with his wife and children until his death in 1848. By 1826, Cole had transitioned into becoming a full-time landscape painter. Alongside Durand, Cole would go on to pioneer the art movement which became known as the Hudson River School, comprising primarily of landscape painters who drew heavily from the aesthetic of European Romanticism, applying its motifs in order to depict the American wilderness, often as a means to commentate on American society at large. This distinctly American brand of Romanticist art often touched on such themes as national identity, divine providence, the passage of time, and the social consequences of industry, urbanization, consumerism, and technological progress. And it was largely due to Cole's influence that these particular subjects ultimately came to dominate the works of the Hudson River Movement's later painters. Cole, a devout Episcopalian, often weaved religious imagery into his paintings in order to convey his deeper philosophical messages. Take for example his 1828 painting, Expulsion from Eden, which, as the name should suggest, depicts the scene from Genesis 3 in which Adam and Eve are banished from the garden after consuming the forbidden fruit. While much can still be appreciated from a surface level interpretation, Cole used this as an allegory in order to symbolize man's loss of innocence, alluding to the popular romanticist insistence that humanity lived in a state of blissful existence, a golden age that had long since been lost due to the corrosive nature of civilization itself. 
Cole also drew from other Western mythological traditions as well, as is the case for his 1847 painting, Prometheus Bound, which, again, as the name should suggest, portrays the titan Prometheus chained to his mountain, the eternal punishment that he received from Zeus for stealing the fire of Olympus and gifting it to mankind so that they could bring about their civilization. An almost Faustian allegory for the unforeseen dangers of pursuing progress for progress's sake. There was a great deal of interplay between the various modes of artistic expression within the realm of American Romanticism, each of which expressed the same themes. Thus, one would not be wrong to identify direct thematic connections between the paintings of Cole and Durand with the writings of Longfellow and Irving, something that was done very much deliberately. As such, it was not uncommon for painters such as Cole to form friendships with their more literary-minded counterparts. These artists and writers would often play off of each other's works. Sometimes this would be done with subtlety. Other times, they would translate the works of their peers into a different artistic medium. One of Cole's most famous paintings, The Last of the Mohicans, is a direct adaptation of a scene from James Fenmore Cooper's book of the same name, one of the great American epics, which is itself littered with philosophical themes which discuss ideas surrounding the nature of American identity and the tragic implications of civilization's triumph over barbarism. In much the same way, Cole too often found allusions to his paintings, both subtle and explicit, in the romanticist literature of his contemporaries, the most famous of which arguably being William Cullen Bryant's poem, The Painter Departing from Europe. As a landscape painter, Thomas Cole is most recognized for his propensity to paint historical scenes, often intending for them to serve as allegories for some aspect of contemporary American culture. In The Architect's Dream, Cole portrays an anachronistic compound of various sacred spaces from different cultures throughout history. A Gothic cathedral, a Doric temple, an Egyptian pyramid, and a depiction of what appears to be the Temple of King Solomon, each symbolizing the greatness of their respective civilizations. Cole operated during a period when America was still in its youth, and this painting very much symbolizes an optimistic vision of what the United States might one day become and that the future could potentially see America rise to become an heir, or even a culmination of these mighty civilizations. Other works of his depict more direct scenes from history, such as Daniel Boone and his cabin, St. John in the Wilderness, and the view of Fort Putnam. But out of all of Cole's historical paintings, there are five that tower above the rest, both in fame and in meaning. First commissioned in 1833 by successful New York merchant and art enthusiast Lumen Reed, among one of Cole's wealthiest patrons, The Course of Empire ranks among the most iconic series of paintings in American history, and is a testament to Romanticist art as a whole. The series consists of five paintings, and depicts the rise and fall of an imaginary city situated in a river valley from its humble birth through its triumphant ascent and to its cataclysmic collapse and eventual decay. Cole was fascinated by the notion of historical cycles and the rise and fall of civilizations, a theme which underlies much of his historical work. Though not a pessimist at heart, Cole, perhaps in part due to his Protestant inclinations, was a firm believer in historical determinism and believed that all nations, no matter how powerful, would always be destined to collapse. He believed that, oftentimes, this inevitable collapse was the result of the nation's own hubris, and it is precisely this message that Cole sought to illustrate. The first of these five paintings, called The Commencement of Empire, or simply The Savage State, showcases the lush wilderness of this fictional valley prior to the rise of the mighty city. Standing in place of the city depicted in the subsequent paintings lies a tiny village, inhabited by who appear to be a band of hunters or warriors. Although the exact time and place of the story which the paintings depict is left vague, these early inhabitants bear a striking resemblance to the indigenous peoples who once called the American wilderness their home, prior to the coming of the European settlers. 
This, along with the landscape's curious resemblance to that of western New York State, is the first and perhaps most blatant allusion that Cole makes to America, a deliberate parallel which delineates the message that lies at the heart of the course of empire. However, Cole is vague as to who, exactly, these people are. Whether they represent primitive peoples who will go on to establish the mighty civilizations showcased in the later paintings, or a tribe of natives who, along with their natural environment, are eventually wiped out by later colonists, is up to individual interpretation. And this was Cole's intention, as it is through this deliberate vagueness that Cole better illustrates his overall point. Given the painting's official title, The Commencement of Empire, it is perhaps best to assume, at least within the context of the story itself, that these primitive peoples are the ones who will go on to build the empire to be. However, the clear allusion to the indigenous Americans was certainly deliberate. The idyllic nature of unadulterated barbarism in contrast to the decadent chaos of civilization is a common motif in Romanticism, and within the context of American Romanticism, and later Transcendentalism, this universal theme was almost always allegorized in the form of the indigenous peoples of North America. We see this too in the writings of Cole's contemporaries, namely in the poetry of people like William Cullen Bryant, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, and Lydia Sigourney, all of whom similarly lamented the loss of what Cole himself affectionately dubbed the Savage State. The second painting in the series, entitled Arcadia, or the Pastoral State, shows us the very same valley from the previous painting. Much of the foliage has been cleared, and the tiny village is nowhere to be seen. In its place sits green pastures and farmlands, with flocks grazing in the fields and a farmer tilling his land. In the distance, along the shores of the river, sits a small settlement, presumably the one that will grow into the sprawling metropolis that we see in the next three paintings. Rather curious is the sacred structure that sits on the hill overlooking the pastures and farmlands, which, instead of a church, resembles that of a Doric temple, the kind that was frequently built by the ancient Greeks. Although subtle, this is the first image that foreshadows what is to come in the following paintings. Prior to the classical era, the agrarian peoples of Greece often built temples on hills overlooking arable land. Over time, communities and villages would sprout up in the immediate surrounding lands. Eventually, these communities would continue to grow, and would in many instances come to coalesce into a single united city. The presence of this temple in the painting, coupled with the village in the distance, is a very subtle implication pertaining to the valley's future and the people who live within it. Most interesting of all is, perhaps, the juxtaposition between the classical architecture of the temple with the uniquely American-inspired landscape. This, along with the fact that the characters shown in the scene are dressed in garb not too dissimilar from that of Cole's own time, is yet another example of Cole's attempt to anachronistically illustrate the parallels between America and the long-fallen empires of the ancient world. Additionally, this artistic choice also indicates with regards to how he viewed the trajectory of American society, that Cole viewed the pastoral state as corresponding to the stage that America was in during the time in which he lived. Foreshadowing is a major element that underlies much of this painting. In addition to the Doric-style Acropolis and the town in the distance, the painting also depicts a concerned-looking woman and a young boy or girl, nervously peering on as a warship is being built just off of the coast, as the child sketches what appears to be a soldier. This is itself a direct reflection of Cole's own anxieties regarding the trajectory of American society, with both the half-drawn sketch of the soldier and the nearly completed warship, soon to be christened, symbolizing the nascent specter of America's own growing imperial ambitions. The third painting in the series differs significantly from the previous two, shifting the perspective away from the valley and closer in on the city itself. Appropriately titled, The Consummation of Empire, Cole gives us a scene depicting his fictional empire as it exists at the height of its power. The most significant contrast between consummation and the previous two paintings is the absence of any natural landscape. 
In more elaborate terms, it is meant to highlight the civilization's victory over the harsh forces of nature and the triumphant ascent of urban society. The illustrious city that Cole portrays resembles that of an ancient Greco-Roman metropolis, not unlike Athens, Rome, or Alexandria. Society appears prosperous and stable, at least in the material sense. The small hill sanctuary from the previous painting has since transformed into a massive temple, which, along with the evident prosperity of the city's inhabitants and the fleet of ships in the harbor, is meant to inform the observer that the metropolis, and by extension, the empire as a whole, has reached its apex. But behind this material prosperity lies a far darker implication, the premonition of the civilization's inevitable demise. Among one of the leading causes of civilizational decline is that of decadence. The more an empire expands beyond its core nation's purview, the more its people are enriched, whether due to the spoils of war, the attainment of economic hegemony, or both. The abundance of wealth, riches, and resources betters the material conditions of the people. This often leads to conspicuous consumption and the vast, unnecessary display of wealth, which consummation clearly depicts. This is perhaps nowhere more evident than in the gaudy, triumphal architecture adorning the city. If the course of empire is to have a thesis, it is the notion that history is deterministic and that decadence is the root cause of every empire's collapse. The overabundance of riches, in combination with the lack of any major external threat, ultimately lulls the population into a lethargy. The virtues of the founders, ideals such as strength, honor, prudence, and faith, ultimately become lost and forgotten, replaced by inherently materialistic notions like greed, hedonism, secularism, and egalitarianism. Although a staunch believer in the promises of the Enlightenment, namely the libertarian ideals upon which his adopted country was founded, Cole was intent on highlighting the dark side of said promises, the most prevalent of which he believed to be the excesses of liberalism and industry. Consummation represents Cole's forecast of what America's future might look like, a future where society is dominated by rampant consumerism, urbanization, and industry, and in many ways, the society that his painting depicts provides an accurate parallel to what America would eventually become by the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Destruction is without a doubt the most famous painting in the course of empire and presents a scene wherein the prosperous city shown in consummation has fallen into a state of calamity. The city is burning as the population flee for their lives. The presence of enemy warships in the harbor and soldiers ransacking the city tells us that the empire has ultimately become weak. It is unclear who these attackers are. Depending on one's interpretation, they could be barbarians who have successfully managed to breach the city's defenses, as evident by the painting's allusion to the sack of Rome by the Vandals. The conquering forces of an emergent rival power, suggested by the presence of an enemy fleet in the harbor, or even an armed rebellion, insinuated by the two brothers fighting one another, each wearing a different colored tunic. Regardless of who the attackers are, however, the meaning of the painting remains unchanged. The most prescient piece of symbolism takes center stage in the painting. If we take a look at the bridge as it appears in destruction, in contrast to that of consummation, we find that the once pristine causeway has collapsed, signifying the weakness and disunity of the falling empire. This illustrates Cole's belief that the cause of a nation's death is both the result of external and internal factors. That a nation divided and fighting amongst itself cannot stand a chance against those far more viral powers from the periphery who seek to devour the decaying empire and its heritage. The fifth and final piece of Cole's series is Desolation. As the name suggests, it shows the very same city from the previous two paintings, now in ruins, some time after the events of destruction. The most prominent theme in this particular painting, as evidenced by the mantle of ivy, foliage, and overgrowth, 
is the idea that nature will always reclaim the land in the very end. The implication here is that civilization is artificial and temporary, and that nature, while capable of being conquered for a time, is an undying and eternal force, the natural order of things. And thus, from here, we see that empire has taken its course. And amidst its fulfillment, we witness the return of the savage state. As is the case with all art and literature, the course of empire is very much a commentary on the society in which its creator lived. While Cole acknowledged the tragic inevitability of empire, and the inevitable tragedy of empire, he believed that it was nonetheless important to educate people on the unmovable nature of civilization's rhythmic cycle. This is precisely why Cole made the stylistic decision to model his fictional empire after Imperial Rome. Not only is the Greco-Roman aesthetic pleasing to the eye, thanks in part to the revitalized interest in classical history that took hold during the Renaissance, but ancient Rome was also almost universally viewed as the ultimate culmination of human achievement and civilization by educated Westerners. Cole also knew that Rome, at the time of its height, viewed itself as being uniquely exceptional. Cole began to notice a very similar sentiment in the U.S., an American exceptionalism start to arise in the 1820s, and, the way Cole saw it, this emergent ethos, which fueled ideas such as Manifest Destiny, was nothing short of a herald for the American empire that was to come. Cole also believed that there was a strong metaphysical correlation between ancient Rome and the United States. To him, they were parallel forces within the histories of their respective civilizations. Likewise, Cole likened ancient Greece to Christian Europe, being the individual points of origin for the respective cultural and imperial traditions that Rome and America would themselves go on to inherit. Cole was also a sucker for subtlety, and believed that were he to portray his fictitious civilization as both Christian and European, it would not only be too on the nose, but also diminish the symbolism that he sought to convey. Cole subscribed to a roughly deterministic, cyclical view of history in an age where Whiggish optimism was still very much gospel. Throughout the 19th century, this perspective was primarily relegated to Romanticists and folks who held Romanticist beliefs. It is not until the early 20th century that we begin to see historians start rejecting the Whiggish philosophy of history. The effects of the Great War a war that pitted all the great empires of the earth against one another, and the degenerate excesses of modernity, were largely responsible for bringing about the rise of this new truth regime. And over the course of the next 50 years, historians and philosophers began devising their own unique civilizational theories, many of which had, despite Cole himself not being a historian, been modeled after the course of empire, which came to serve as almost something of a basic historical template for many of these models. It should be noted that many of the visual allegories that Cole makes throughout the course of Empire, particularly those which allude to the passing of time, were also incorporated into the theories of these later historians, turning them into poetic metaphors. Each of the five paintings shows the valley at both a different time of day and during a different season. Commencement portrays a springtime day at dawn, just after a storm, Arcadia depicts a bright, sunny morning on the cusp of spring and summer consummation that takes place sometime just after noon in the nascent days of autumn. Destruction, in turn, occurs on a stormy evening in the colder months, with clouds not unlike those of commencement's receding storm beginning to amass above the battle-torn city. Finally, the scene shown in desolation is set around midnight, or at some point in the early hours of the morning in the earliest days of spring, thus bringing it full cycle. The seasons have always symbolized the circle of life, and Cole sought to apply this very perennial metaphor to portray the life cycle of a civilization. Springtime represents birth and virility, summer, youth, autumn, maturity, and winter, death. Given the springtime setting of desolation, 
Cole implies the possibility of renewal. Likewise, the decision to set the scene in the early morning hours similarly seeks to illustrate the fact that a new dawn is on the horizon. Thomas Cole was not a historian. Yet while his historical paintings and the philosophical symbols and ideas embedded within them, namely the course of empire, have nonetheless made a greater impact on the study of history than most history books. Cole's attempt to illustrate the course of history on the canvas has provided generations of historians and history enthusiasts with a definitive visual reference to the organic historical process. A visual reference that has been instrumental in helping people make sense of history itself. He offered a novel, and perhaps more realistic, way of looking at history. Thus, our current understanding of history might not exist if not for him. However, while we may look at these five paintings as a broader visual representation of how history unfolds, it would be unwise to overlook the deeper message that Cole was trying to send to the people of his own time, and it would be even more unwise if we were to dismiss this message as being irrelevant to our own time. In fact, it is more pertinent than ever. We are currently living in the world of consummation. Our society today very much confirms the fears that Cole had about the future of his adopted country. Our culture today is overrun with the very same decadence and institutional unsustainability that Cole believed would be the ultimate downfall of American society. And because of this, the course of empire and its underlying message has never been any more relevant than it is today. Thomas Cole can be called many things. Painter, adventurer, romanticist, even philosopher. But if there is one word that might best describe him, that word would be prophet. But that is not to say that he was divinely inspired. Quite the contrary. Cole was an ordinary man with an ordinary interest, captivated by the most ordinary facets of nature. Yet in doing so, he was able to do the extraordinary. Throughout his life, he was able to concoct among some of the most extraordinary artistic creations of his generation, if not that entire first full century of his nation's existence. Through his art, he was able to capture the beauty of the American landscape, both the remarkable and the mundane, and in doing so, amidst an age where the kind of work he did was on the verge of being made obsolete due to the very technology that he feared, managed to produce the very artistic works that still Till this day, continue to define how we view the American landscape. But it was not merely the American landscape that Cole succeeded in capturing, but the American psyche as well. All of Cole's paintings reflect the anxieties of a people and a nation on the cusp of a mighty epochal transition, a flowering America on the precipice of her golden summer, a summer of prosperity, of industry, of technological mastery, and of empire. And while he may not have lived long enough to see what that summer would bring about, nor the harvest of its ensuing autumn, both the bad and the good, he nonetheless was able to intuitively predict, like a prophet and with startling accuracy, what was indeed to come. Thomas Cole was to the canvas what historians are to the page, a conjurer of vivid imagery who sought to depict both the world as it was and the world as it will likely be. And although he intended for his paintings, namely those of the course of empire, his magnum opus, to be a representation of America and her own burgeoning imperial trajectory, the message he sought to convey is one that will continue to remain relevant even long after America has taken her course. Cole's work speaks to us all, as humans, and aims to show us that our hubris as men is not only something that blinds us to our faults, 
but is a fault in itself, and that it is the leading fault responsible for our own undoing. As such, he will continue to speak to future generations of men and women long after we and the empire that we have inherited are long gone. And to that end, his message will forever live on and seek to serve as a warning to all who seek to build the next Rome or the next United States. And as for those whom they are, they might do best to keep Cole and his work in mind, to know, no matter how great or how mighty an empire it is they might make, that such greatness is not exempt of, and is thus still beholden to, the unmovable laws of history, that there is no escaping the course of empire. <laughs>